Hi, I'm Dave Sussman, back with you at Whiskey Politics with Dave Sussman. And uh, you can find us on America's Voice Network, ricochet.com for the podcast and all the podcast applications. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, please don't forget to give us a five-star rating. Victor Davis Hansen is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, a contributor to National Review, Town Hall, and The Federalist. And you've frequently seen Victor all over the news channels. He is also an author, most recently, of the Second World Wars, How the First Global Conflict was fought and won. You can join Victor and other luminaries on the Hillsdale College Cruise 2018 to Hawaii from July the 15th to the 31st. And Whiskey Politics' own producer, Melissa Premonitus, will also be there and joining as well. Victor, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Before we get into some questions, some from Ricochet members, some from our Facebook uh, uh, fans, uh, I, I just got to say, this week has been a whirlwind unlike any other I can remember in political history. Yeah. Um, and I follow politics. In just the past couple of days alone, we've seen um, historic Supreme Court decisions on immigration, on the unions. Uh, President Trump now has a vacancy to fill. And this was in addition to uh, following the verbal attacks on Trump administration officials. And we're starting to see this heightened sense of... Uh, uh, it's it's almost verbal, if if not uh, eventually becoming physical violence, where some of these people are harassing people in restaurants and such. In fact, we're seeing some of the leaders on the left calling for more of this. Mm -hmm. um, the media is still showing pictures of children at the uh, at the border, and we saw an upset election just outside of New York City a couple of nights ago, where we now have a devout socialist running for Congress. This is just all in the past couple of days. This question is really about how you as an individual um, and, and us how, that, that want to stay informed, how do we not burn out? How do you not burn out at this feverish pace? Well, you have to tune, you have to be selective and discriminate. So you don't want to spend your time following what Maxine Waters does, for example. But I look at it as there's two centrifugal forces. There's a superficial veneer and that's the left's angry, they're going to the red hen, things like that, and trying to practice civil disobedience or disruption. And they're at this election of a socialist, as you mentioned, in New York. But at the same time, we're seeing this surface down deeper below the epidermis are the real changes of power. And so this is the first time probably in 35 years there's going to be a conservative court. And Trump will have made two court appointments more than, just than Bush or Obama. Uh, did in theirs, and he may make three. That'll be more, I should say. Right. And that's real power. It's a shift of power. And when you look at these court decisions, you, I was in the union by default at Cal State Fresno for 21 years. I never joined, but I had I, my. I was in the union in the sense they took my dues from me, and that when they passed that law, the the union just exploded. We only had 20 percent people participating. Once that law was passed, they didn't even want to talk to you because they had your money anyway, mm -hmm. and they had 100% participation by confiscation. So there are revolutionary things happening under the Trump administration, but uh, and it's real ch shift in power and influence, and I think this hysterical, superficial, media-generated uh, outburst or a reaction to it, but they don't have power, and that's why they get more and more frustrated. We're seeing that almost uh, people just pulling their hair out and on social media, it's getting really, really ugly. Uh, you know, there's some questions that I want to talk about and how divided we are now as a country. Uh, I remember the Bush derangement syndrome yes. back in, in the early 2000s, especially after the Iraq war. Uh, the, the, the questions that, that, I mean, the Bush years especially. Um, Kurt North at Ricochet asks, and I'll paraphrase this question, short of an outside military threat, what could unite us all again? Well, what, what's going to unite us is the same thing with LBJ's uh, landslide victory or Ronald Reagan's. So Reagan was supposedly a kook, an actor, a lightweight, and then he, A, got elected by a large margin, re-elected, I should say, in 84. But we forget that up until he got re-elected, the country was divided. People were talking about Mondale as the ideal candidate, young, handsome, uh, a... Uh, Lib a classic liberal from Minnesota. And then in that period from November 83 to November 84, the economy grew at 7% GDP. Mm -hmm. So if Trump were able to get a 4, 4.5% GDP unemployment, get down to 3.5. Which is being predicted, by the way, for the third quarter. It, I think. it is. Yeah. It is. Then you, he, and if he were to hold the House and pick up seats in the Senate 
and get reelected, then I think people would make the necessary political adjustments. Uh, whether you like it or not, 60% of American people don't have strong ideological affinities. They want to be with a winner. It's why the, the 49ers or the Rams have big crowds when they win and then nobody shows up when they lose. So people will gravitate toward a perceived sense of success. I think that's already happening with Trump a little bit. I don't know about you, but when I talk to uh, never Trump people, for example, mm -hmm. and the conservative, I haven't met one that says, um, I should say conservatives that voted for Trump, I haven't met one who said, I'm not going to vote for him again. But I have met never Trump people who said, you know what, I didn't like the guy, I didn't vote for him, but I'm going to vote for him again. But I don't, I don't find the opposite phenomenon. I'm hearing that as well. And they, and in fact, some of them are taking offense to being called a never Trump, but they're yes. saying, I'm a Trump skeptic. Yes, or I call balls and strikes. Right, right. Yeah. And that's fine. I think that, that that's fine. But I just haven't seen Trump supporters say, you know, he's really disappointed me. I don't like this economic, foreign policy, judicial agenda. It didn't work, and I'm not going to vote for him. I, that's l much less frequent, I think, than the people ha who have been won over. There's a lot of discussion that we're in this uh, pre-Civil War mode. Yes. Um, Suspira at Ricochet mentioned that Dennis Miller noted the USA seems more fractured than even right before the Civil War, and you seem to agree. Can you expand on that? Well, I think what's dangerous, we've had these periods of unrest in the 30s uh, during the Depression, and we had them in the 60s, and I remember the 60s and 70s, but when you have ideological fault lines, and they tend to be geographic as well, north-south, then they're force multipliers. And what we're seeing now is really an ideological but also a geographical fault. And by that I mean we have these two coastal enclaves from Seattle to San Diego and from Boston down to maybe the coast of Florida. And these are people who have really done well under globalization. That's where Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, that's where Google, Amazon, mm -hmm. Facebook, Apple are, that's where house prices. And in the middle, the people who had really championed muscular labor Anything that you could do with your hands or your arms or build or fabricate was more likely to be outsourced. So what you and I are doing today, we're not worried about the Koreans or the South Vietnamese or the Bolivians doing what we're doing. If we were out here working on a lathe, we would be. And so that red interior ideologically and geographically is, is, a, is a antithetical to this coastal hipster pajama boy life of Julia culture. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a potent thing when you have people who identify with a place and an idea, not just an idea or not just a place, but both. So the, when you talk about a pre-Civil War mentality then, what does that look like? I mean, we're starting to see the Maxine Waters and some other types that are calling for harassing people, yeah. but you know that leads to violence. Yeah. I mean, we saw this with the, I think he was a Bernie guy that shot up the baseball game yes. last year, the, yes. right? The Republicans yeah. and, and Steve well, Sinise. And, as a historian, you always look to see at what point could that have been avoided. Right. But, and in the Civil War, there were calm voices in the North who said, we don't like slavery, it's an abomination. Let's see if we can buy slaves out over a 20 year period. And there were people in the South that said, uh, okay, I'm willing to do that. But there were extremists on both sides that said, sell out, sell out. And that's what, and that, they drove the, the conversation. And I think what hap what's happening right now, one of two things are gonna happen. The left is either gonna go the way of George McGovern or uh, Walter Mondale. In other words, they're gonna get their wish. They're gonna, they're gonna nominate a hard leftist. He's gonna destroy the party. Or they're gonna get, they're gonna resort to the 70s street, street style violence. And, we, and I remember, people forget, I mean, there were a thousand bombings a year in 71, 72. Sure. And we could go either way. But I think, to be honest, Barack Obama destroyed the Democratic Party. When he came in, he had a good chance of winning the court with appointments. He mm -hmm. had the House, he had the Senate. He was even on the state level, and when he left office, he'd lost over 1,100 state offices, legislatures, governorships, House, Senate, Supreme Court, and people forget that. But he, he went so far left that he destroyed his party, and I think that's a lot of the anguish. They don't have power, and their only power is vocal, rhetorical, the universities, the foundations, Hollywood, the entertainment, uh, journalism, media, but not real power. Do they realize how off-putting many of them are, no. the, the De Niro's and, no, and the like? because 
because we're in Malibu and they're, I mean, they're talking with like kind. And what's new a little bit about this uh, protest, we haven't really seen it. The Democratic Party used to be the Workers' Party, but now it's a pure middle party of poor people that are on, you know, that look to government for assistance and the top cone or the top te uh, stone in the pyramid and they're very affluent and they're the official voice or the policy makers, Hollywood actors, and they have no idea the resentment that they incur and people don't like them. And it, they're going in, they're going, it's a train wreck and it looks like to me Mondale and McGovern all over again if they continue this. Yeah, so the economy stays good, maybe even grows yeah. as predicted by the Federal Reserve. Uh, you don't have a black swan event. Yeah. If North Korea, and I want to talk about that in a couple of minutes with you, continues on the trajectory. Uh, announcement today that uh, Trump is going to be meeting with Putin. Yeah. Uh, so geopolitically, it looks good. Things are good. Economically, things look good. You can expect what in 2020, a, a Mondale type blowout situation? If, if things continue the way they are and uh, you can see the things that the left thought would derail Trump. The, the border psychodrama that was kind of manufactured. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't have the, neat, the intended effect. The NFL controversy. So Trump has a, an animal cunning, and when he wades into these uh, controversies, he's very careful to see where 51 percent of public opinion is, and he's not on the wrong side of that. And the left hasn't figured that out yet. So every time they want to draw him into an argument. He doesn't go in there unless he thinks, uh, he looks to see which is the winning side. I mean, not to say that he doesn't have ideological concerns, but he's got a cunning. So I, I don't, unless there's a, uh, what, again, the answer is what destroyed past presidents. It was the Iraq war destroyed George Bush. And the so-called greatest uh, recession in history, which it wasn't, but uh, Clinton, convince people that George H.W. Bush had lied about taxes. Right. It was a small recession. It was a small it was recession, a but that destroyed yeah. the first Bush presidency. As, as Perot did. Yeah. Too. yeah, and Perot did too, and, and twice. Right. Uh, uh, and Clinton was a beneficiary in two elections. So unless we have something like that, I think there's a 55, 45 chance that Trump will get reelected, but who knows? It's I'm starting to see diehard liberal friends of mine on social media coming to terms with the fact that this president is likely to be reelected. Yeah. And when they say that, uh, ostensibly they're saying, well, I don't like it, but I'm just I'm coming to grips with reality. But deep down inside, there are certain elements that are bothering classical liberals. When they see what Maxine Waters is saying, or when they see the anti-Semitism that surrounds this candidate in New York, mm -hmm. uh, there's certain things that they don't want to talk about. But when you say 24-7 in the university or MSNBC, white supremacy, white supremacy, white privilege, white privilege, and you're a guy like Chuck Schumer, what do you think? Or you're a guy, you know, an old stalwart of the party like Jerry Brown, what do you, what do you think? That has to be in some way directed at them. And before it was always, well, I'm a white male who believes in all of your your identity politics, but I'm exempt from it. And I don't think they're exempt anymore. Yeah. They're culpable by their appearance, just as anybody else that believes in that doctrine of identity politics. Speaking of Schumer, uh, you know, you, there's videos that are floating around social media right now that show him just a few years ago talking out about against uh, against illegal immigration. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that right now and go into yeah. an article that you just wrote, Mexico, What Went Wrong? You say, we're about to see a very abnormal president just south of the American border who has been campaigning, strangely enough, on urging Mexicans to leave their towns and find life in the United States, that they have a human right to enter the United States as they please. What is this about? Well, I think it's a changed attitude in Mexico. NAFTA did not work as the architects 34 years ago okay. predicted. So they've got a $70 billion surplus with us. They got 30 billion remittances, mostly from illegal aliens. They got 20 billion in cartel money, and they have open border to export human capital. They find difficult, apparently, in lieu of social reform. They just export dissidents, potential dissidents. So I, I think what they're saying to us is, we, we want to institutionalize that relationship. We have control over your destiny. We can allow transit. Uh, a million people the last five years come from South America to the border or Central America, and they want to preserve that imbalance. So Trump comes back and says, this is abnormal. You can't run all of these uh, deficits of different types with us. You can't have cartels. You can't have a veto over our policy. And they're going to have to, I mean, what are they going to do? Is Obrador, when he's elected next week, is he going to, or this week, is he going right. to say, 
I don't like that trade surplus. <laughs> I want it balanced. Is he going to say, those remittances are too much. I, I feel they come off the back of our expatriates. So he's going to say- What is that, like $30 billion? $30 billion and that's, 25 that's billion. That's huge. It is. And he's not going to say, I want all my, my amigos, my expatriate friends, I want them back in my country. He's not right. going to say that. He's not going to say um, the cartels are not going to have any business in the United States. So he has no cards to play and he knows it. So he, he, he's sort of rhetorical. Otherwise, uh, you know, as far as your earlier question about the Democrats, that used to be that they were against illegal immigration because, like Cesar Chavez had advised them, it hurt union and entry-level workers. They didn't want competition. Chavez took people, thugs down on the border, I remember that in the 70s, to beat up illegal aliens that tried to come in because farm, uh, corporate farms were using them to undercut the union. And then there was the idea that our people, Americans, were, uh, that we don't want our social services taxed by foreign nationals. This is the democratic position. And so once o Obama was elected and he created this new formula that whether you're Puerto Rican or Hispanic or Asian or black, it's sort of Jesse Jackson's silly rainbow thing come alive. As long as you're not white, you're a new coalition of people and you will vote according to your identity. And that was a new idea, and that just changed that when the Obama won, the Democrats said, wow, we flipped Colorado, we flipped New Mexico, we flipped uh, Nevada, we flipped New, um, California. This is a winning formula to import new liberal voters, and that's where we are now. They, and they've flipped, as you said, entirely. This is the push then. So we talk about this and, we, and people have argued about this for, for, for several years now, but it really comes down to the power base of the Democrats. They would prefer to put party over country. Yeah, I, well, they would say that they're fulfilling the promise of America, bring your, your tired, your poor, and we're going to bring them in and we're going to acculturate them to gov big government so they'll get assistance on you know legal help education welfare housing and then they'll go to work for government work at the DMV and that'll be an entry and that's what it should be the problem they had with the country was still 70 percent so-called white and that's a very fluid idea but what Trump saw was he thought I can't win California anyway Mm -hmm. And I can't win New Mexico anyway. I can't win Nevada anyway. But I can win Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio and other Pennsylvania on the basis of you guys are American. You believe in the rule of law. This is illegal. Sanctuary cities are unconstitutional. And that's what these people want to do. And so the Democrats never, if they're right about importing voters and flipping the electoral college, that's still 10 or 15 years away and then because I don't think Texas is going to flip for a while I don't think that Arizona is going to flip for a while but more importantly oh, the Democrats thought that Obama's excitement and his ability to get out voters on the basis of identity politics and at such numbers was automatically transferable to a 69 year old white woman millionaire Hillary Clinton and it wasn't and they needed it to be because they had lost a record number of white people, working white people who said, you know what, if everybody's gonna talk about identity politics and they're gonna blame me for white privilege, I don't have any white privilege. I'm, I'm out of a job, I make almost nothing. And when a guy in Hollywood yells at me about white privilege, I, I get angry about that. So they created, a, they created an alternate view of American politics. You know, you had a piece, I think it was just a couple of days ago, in townhall.com, and you said progressives should back up their rhetoric on immigration, and it refers to using educational institutions, use their dorms to house yes, some yes. of these people. What does that look like in your mind? Well, I mean, we're saying that these, I think, pretty well-run detention centers, or, I mean, we've had Michael Hayden tweet pictures of auschwitz bergenau as if it was a an extermination camp. So if the left really believes that, and we're looking at a campus right here and over there at UCLA and USC, we've got literally thousands of dorm rooms that are half full in the summer. Why not the government could contract with Harvard, Yale, Stanford, UCLA, UC San Diego, any, any university they wanted and say, you know what, would you take 500 families, put them in the dorms, you have law schools there, you could get free legal counsel, you have med schools, you could get a medical examination, you have thousands of kids that go in for internships, you could use them, it's a real resource. And yet, 
that's not going to happen because much of the elite left anguish is a virtue signaling, I'm so upset, but um, if you, I'm looking down at Malibu estates on the ocean, I don't think that the people who clean and cook and do the landscaping are considered equals by the people who live behind those walls and their kids do not go to LA Unified School District type schools. And so uh, that's the problem the left has. Again, when you don't have a middle class in your party, you have an elite on top and then you have um, a group of you know, needy people who need government support in the bottom and, and, and the way that that works is you like people that have your culture and your taste at top and you like to be sympathetic to or romanticize people at the bottom and you hate people in the middle class. These are the guys that have Winnebago's or jet skis or you know, um, snowmobiling and the Sarah Palin types. You just don't like those people. Sarah Huckleby Sanders. And uh, that, that's what's happened to the Democratic Party. It's a two so is this a calling bluff? I mean, you, obviously you're talking about a, a very heightened NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard mm -hmm. approach, you know, which is what the left, you know, is, oh, we, we should do this and this yeah. and this, but I just don't want it here behind these gates in the, yeah. in the colony. Yeah. Um, is, is that what this is? Yeah, it is. I, I live in an area that's about 90% Hispanic, about 40% illegal alien. Right. All the farmhouses on my street have been... Uh, are rented out to people from Mexico. They have trailers, and I, I can live there fine. And I, when I go to Stanford, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. The difference is that people in my community are worried about the impact of illegal immigration. People in Stanford aren't three hours away. So what I would say is try it. It would be good for you because you get to know the other that you champion in the abstract. And you might, you might enjoy it. You might enjoy teaching the kids. You might want to help them on a, an asylum request, and you could give a clean, room and you could have a clean sanitation and you could have everything you want and the government could contract out we do that all the time with uh, private carers caregivers i want to get back to mexico yeah. and, and california here in just a minute as well but on immigration we're seeing this impacting europe as well yes and kozak a, a ricochet member asks says dr hansen do you foresee a blowback in europe by the citizens for the forced and unpopular massive immigration being promoted by their governments yeah i do i think it's already happened i'm not sure the merkel government's going to survive we've seen the revolution in italy same thing is happening in greece and the problem with the eu in general is that before the immigration it was fractured north and south over the financial problem it was fractured east and west with brexit it was fractured uh, with Which Germany. the Queen just pa uh, pushed through today, right? Yes, I yes. The news and then yeah. it was fractured with Vladimir Putin's use of natural gas that Germany wanted and the Eastern Europeans were scared about. And this was sort of the crowning blow to the, the whole idea that Germany is in a, almost a postmodern Prussian arrogant sense is again dictated. Now it's not dictating to Greece about uh, financial reform that's dictating to them about you're going to take these immigrants and you're going to put them in camps and you're going to house them and then we'll take some up here and then you guys in Eastern Europe and to people who are not German it's 1871, 1914, 1939 all over again and Germans can't believe that they're, they're clueless because they say well we're humanitarian we're doing this for the greater good of humanity and people said yeah you may think that but you're acting like Prussians Mm -hmm. and we don't want it anymore, and I think it's going to split the EU. Uh, I think it really, I don't see the EU is going to be here like it, they thought it would be in 20 years. It's going to go back to something like the European common market. What does Merkel losing look like for the EU? Where does the power base come from now? Well, I think it's going to be decentralized. I think mm -hmm. you're going to have four or five EUs. You're going to have a southern EU of Spain, Italy, and Greece. You're going to have an Eastern Europe, Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary. You're going to have a Western Europe, France, Netherlands, Germany. But it's not going to be run out of Brussels or Strasbourg mm -hmm. as a federated state anymore. I just don't see that happening. So you don't have unelected officials in Brussels controlling Juncker and well, so on Well, you, so you might. I mean, the Europeans always find a way to take care of their elites and their aristocrats. Right. They might be a... a token body, but I just don't think people are going to listen to them anymore and we're going to sort of fragment into regional areas and they'll probably have little or no tariffs between each block. But Does that reverse the immigration from North Africa and the Middle East? Yeah, or? I think it will because all Italy has to do, and it's doing it right now, is saying you're not going to come to our shores. Unlike Germany, they do have the Mediterranean and they can't stop ships and turn them around. Or they can say go to Spain and they have a socialist government 
And that's, that's what's going to undermine it. When people say we have to have open borders, other people say, you can have them. We don't want them, but we'll, if you want them, we'll, we'll let you have them. That's a hard argument to refute. Back to Mexico. Trump has referred to wanting, and he talked about this during the campaign and, and since, to renegotiate NAFTA, where you refer to Mexico running a NAFTA-protected 70 billion trade surplus with the U.S., larger than any other American trade partner except China. Um, does that happen? We, we're seeing him push back against Canada right now with, with, with trade and tariffs, uh, with this new president that looks uh, likely here in the next few days. What does NAFTA look like? Well, I think what Trump does, it's the art of the deal, art of the comeback, how to mm-hmm. be a billionaire type book that he co-authored or was ghostwritten. And so he always asks for three times what he's willing to, to take. And what he's willing to take is a 52, 53 percent deal. And so he's saying to NAFTA, we're not going to run trade surpluses with both of you guys and not at this magnitude. That's not what it was designed about. We're not going to have open borders. So we're either going to get out of it or we're going to have to renegotiate. But what he would probably say to Canada is, let's run a 6 or $7 billion trade deficit with you. Let's run a $20 billion trade deficit with you, Mexico. Let's close the border and uh, let's have you clamp down on cartels. But that hasn't worked in the past with Bush, Obama, and previous, but this hyperbole has, at least with Iran and, and North Korea and other things. So that's where we are. And, and he has to become almost hysterical to get a, a modest advantage again. And I think that's what he's trying to do. Trade tariffs around the world uh, just this week with, with the huge avalanche of news that we've seen, major stories are getting bypassed. One smaller story that was bypassed is that China is starting to balk a little bit on trade. And they're yes. saying that we can't be, a, a lot of people don't realize this, but China is slowing down economically. Yes. Uh, and they're now saying we can't afford a trade war with the United States. Do you think they're coming to the table? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, we talk about the great Chinese economy, but it's still smaller in most metrics in the United States. And we only have a third of the population. So basically, a, one American produces more goods and services than three Chinese people. So we're still, and we're getting much more efficient. And China's a mercantile uh, economy, so it's not going to be as effective. They're much more vo- vulnerable to exports, and so they're gonna cut right. a deal. And we have North Korea to, to bring into the wager, but the way Trump is negotiating, he's got so many cards to play. He's got a better economy than they do. He's got a much bigger military than they do. And most importantly, he's got Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan that are all capable of going nuclear, and they can do it like they do Kias and Toyotas. And so he's got a lot of cards that he's playing, I think, with this new security team of Bolton and Pompeo, mm-hmm. that they're, they're pretty adept at it. Okay. So the great outrage we saw from the left was about the children being separated from, from the adults, a policy that, by the way, barely raised an eyebrow in 2014 when Obama was doing yeah. it. Uh, but do you find it a little convenient that this removed, removed any news about the FBI shenanigans uh, towards Trump during the election? Yeah, I do. But that's sort of like a, an IED that's just there, the, the entire uh, Mueller investigation, because he hasn't found anything. He's trying to indict Russians, and he thought they wouldn't show up. They're going to show up, and they're going to want documentation. Right. And he's not going to be able to produce it. And so I think where they we... They did are, show up, by the way. Yeah, they, they did. And, and yes. I don't think he wants them to show up. In the courts. Yes. yes. He, he does not want to go there. So I think what's happening is the left ever so insidiously and incrementally is being pushed into a position that is very on left. They're going to be in the position of saying it's basically okay for a government agency to delude a FISA court and not give them the full information about the dossier. They're going to say there may have been three or four contract informants in the Trump campaign. That's okay. You can monitor with an informant, spy, whatever term you use during a political campaign. We're going to learn that Susan Rice, Samantha Power, uh, made dozens, if not hundreds, of requests to en masse names. And then those names were leaked in October and early November to the press. That's going to come out. And then we're going to see people in the FBI whose testimony struck McCabe, Comey, cannot be, uh, they can't be reconciled. And so there's a lot of things that if I were a, a person of the left, I would say to myself, there were violations of civil liberties, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to deny that, and yet they haven't done that yet. 
Well, the left seemed to want to protect them and try to divert attention back to, I mean, you see it in these hearings with um, mm -hmm. uh, the IG and, and others that, that, that are sitting in, in Congress as we're speaking right now. And the left keep coming out and talking about the children at the border. Yeah. It's well, they a don't have a diversion. Uh, yeah, I think the, the answer is they don't have a winning, they don't have a winning agenda. They can't say the tax cuts were bad, we want to raise taxes, or mm -hmm. we, we want to shut down ANWR, we don't like all the fossil fuel development, or uh, your, your NATO should be able to spend what they want in defense, don't bully them. They don't have an agenda, a counter agenda. So we got the voting machines that right after Trump was elected were supposedly fraudulent. We got the emoluments clause trope. We got the 25th Amendment, Trump was supposedly crazy or physically unfit. We got the boycott of the inauguration. We got early impeachment. Uh, we've got Jill Stein suing. We, we've gone through, we've had the assassination chic with, we had, you know, Kathy Griffin or Johnny Depp. So we've gone through each of these efforts and they all hit a dead end and the Mueller's hitting a dead end. And what they don't realize is Trump was elected in a fair and open election and the fault was Hillary Clinton. She blew a big lead the way that she campaigned very foolishly in search of a great white whale called a mandate. And the result of it is they need to come up with a counter agenda and say Trumpism doesn't work economically, politically, socially, foreign policy, and here's what does, but they can't do that. So they're trying to find the magic key that opens this lock and destroys this presidency. And I don't think they're gonna find it. Well, they're actually talking down the economy. They're yes. talking down peace with North Korea. You see that with Bill Maher and, and others that, that you know, say, that, well, the only way for us to, to, to win back the House or, or win back the presidency one day is for Trump recession. And, and I mean, again, party over country. Yeah, are they in the left? And that's true always of the left. They feel that because they're for equality and fairness and egalitarianism, that their noble ends justify any means getting there. So if yeah. you put a million people out of work in a recession, that's okay. It's not going to impact Bill Maher down no, here on the, no, it's on not. the coast. It's not. And it's going right. to be for the greater good of ruining Trump. And that's how they always think. And that's what's disturbing. That's why they're so insidious, because they can justify going in and shouting a person down or uh, doing any type of violent act uh, because it's for the people. Yeah. So we're here in Malibu. You spoke last night right uh, across the street at Pepperdine University. Yes. Last time we spoke, we had you on, on the podcast, you discussed your experiences living in Central California, yeah. how the illegal immigration population has um, not only negatively impacted the California economy, but the standard of living. This November, we have a very strange measure on the ballot. Yeah. And somehow made it. I don't understand how. But the question is, and this is from a Ricochet member, Jamie Lockett, and other Ricochet members voiced this as well. What do you think of the movement to split, split California into three states? Well, I think it, it was designed to get more liberal Senate seats, and that's okay. But in practical terms, I think it makes sense because California is really, if you think about it, Mississippi and Massachusetts in the same state. We've got this San Diego to Berkeley <laughs> corridor where housing can be a thousand, uh, probably here two thousand dollars a square foot. Right. And then you have Fresno, Bakersfield, Merced, Madera, the foothills where a house is one hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. You've got Cal State Tulare, uh, Cal State Turlock, or Cal State Bakersfield as really the only educational opportunities versus Caltech, Stanford, USC, UCLA. You've got Stanford Med Center versus Clovis Community Hospital. So they're two different cultures and uh, they're two different ideologies, and, and they don't make sense being governed by people on the coast. So where I am, we're here, it's about 70 degrees year round here, as I mm -hmm. remember teaching in the winter. Where I am, uh, it's 30, 30 cents a kilowatt hour at peak time. Mm -hmm. Hispanic people go into my, uh, I just went to Walmart two days ago, 104, they're in there to get free air conditioning. There's no need to have air conditioning here. Yet the people who live in, live in these climates, they set, the PUC rates on electricity. Same is true in water, Hetch Hetchy water supply. All this water that's coming in here is from water transfers, mm -hmm. the California Aqueduct or the Hoover Dam, etc., or Owens Valley. Owens, yep. And they don't like water transfers in theory, so they cut off other people's water for fish. And we could go down the line on every one high speed rail, let's build it down there and start out and see if it works or not, but not up here yet. And so it's two states already. And I don't mind if they split off. I really don't, even though I understand what the driving force is.
how does that impact electorally? I mean, we're talking about four to six liberal senators, yes. probably a moderate senator from Central California. I think the net would be two. You'd have, I mean, it has to be ratified by the state, so it won't be. But in right. theory, you'd have six senators, and four of them would be probably liberal, and two would be conservative, probably. And they would be a net plus. For okay. the, for, it would impact the. It wouldn't impact the house as I see it because that's pretty much we have, as, tr as far as house districts, we already have three states. Where I live, we have three Republicans. Right. And the idea that there's going to be a Republican, really a real Republican from San Diego, Berkeley, is very rare. So we're already split as far as uh, the districts. But on the state level, that split means that we don't have any power. Federally, that we, we get helped out by, you know, Wyoming or Nebraska. But in the state legislature, we're, they, they doom the conservatives because they they're just overwhelmed by uh, where the population centers are that are left wing. So that would, that would I think, alleviate that problem. You'd would, have your own state government that was, would affect the interest of your region. With all the man-made problems created by Sacramento and California, have you ever considered moving? Yeah, I, I do all the time because I, I'm a fifth generation Californian. Mm -hmm. I live in the same house that my great-great-grandmother do, but a lot of people in my family quit farming or went broke and they moved out of state or they moved to the coast and I'm about the only person in my family left and I don't think my children want to live in the environment that it's become. So I, I've thought about it all the time. I don't like paying you know, 30s, it was 39% federal income tax, and then you can go up to 13% or 12% on your income, and you add Obama. I don't like doing that. Not so much because I'm a greedy person, but when I look at the how that money is used, I see that California has the highest sales income gas taxes, and then and some property taxes given the assessments, though not the rate, but when I look at what we get in return, 49th by Forbes on infrastructure, highways. Mm -hmm. I think it's 44th in the nation on test scores. Uh, our hospitals, emergency rooms are not good. Our Air LAX is a mess. So I don't see that the government uses that money, state government, for the people. I don't want to spend $10 million to hire a state legal team to sue the federal government to nullify federal immigration law. Uh, I don't really like going into the store and seeing WIC cards used by people who are not here legally. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like that because it takes resources away from U.S. citizens. You know, there's a, there's been a push now for quite some time and it's certainly um, elevated after the election. Secession, is that a reality? Well, that comes mostly from the left right. and uh, I don't think it is because with all things on the left, it's sort of an emotional response. So when I see these young techies on TV or radio or in the paper saying, we can succeed, and I, I ask myself, okay, what are you going to do about Yosemite National Park? Yeah. And who owns Kings Canyon? And who owns Edwards Air Force Base? And who owns your local federal courthouse? Because and water rights. And water rights. And they, yeah. they're so ignorant yeah. historically, they don't realize that that was really the powder keg that blew up the Union. It wasn't just slavery. Yeah. It was the practical manifestations of be arguing over slavery. And that, by that I mean people in the South said Fort Sumner is not a federal, it's our fort. And people said the, ar the armory or the post office in Montgomery is ours and the federal government. Lincoln said you cannot take federal property. You don't mm -hmm. own it. And that's what really led to the Civil War. And that was a way that he tried to abolish uh, the difference. He said, you know, it's ultimately about slavery. I can't say that because we're not, we're not there politically yet. So now we're going to say you cannot invade federal property within state confines and, and absorb it. And that's what, that's what, that was the trigger that started the war. David Jagged uh, on Facebook wants to know, when you write, is the objective to communicate with fellow conservative liberty lovers or to influence someone on the left? I, I think both. Um, what I try to do is two things. I say if you hate my guts and you hate my position, is there a way in this that you can see my point of view? And by that I mean I don't try to gratuitously call people names. Mm -hmm. I try to use adjectives that are, I don't, I don't call people names. I don't use profanity. I don't get no, hysterical. you're very civil. Yeah, Absolutely. I try to be very civil. Yeah. And then, uh, 
I also try to say, say to myself, if you're a conservative and you believe in this, do you feel this is authentic and genuine or am I trying to hedge and try to virtue signal or, or am I writing disingenuously? I try not to do that. And I, and I think that's what you have to do. I have some advantage because I think I'm the only conservative in my family. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with two first cousins and three sibling, two siblings that were all, and are all people of the left. Mm -hmm. So I, got, I, I had to get along with them my entire life. I think we all do. I mean, there's no lockstep, you know, family that's out there. Well, maybe there are, but uh, I mean, I have to play that same tightrope game as well. I've got friends of mine. I've got cousins. I've got a cousin that works for BBC in London. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have to be somewhat diplomatic and very civil in your approach, but I think you educate people. And I think your goal is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, your goal is to lay out the facts. This is what they are and, you know, take it, leave it. But yeah. this is what it is. I've noticed one thing that gets people very angry is the exposure of irony or hypocrisy or paradox. So if I say, uh, if we, we just mentioned about the college dorm, yeah. That seems a very sensible proposition, but something like that sets people on fire. So if you're in Malibu or you're in Atherton and you have a wall and I write and say, if you want, you don't, you don't want a wall on the border, then please, Mark Zuckerberg, take down your wall on your estate. Right. That is the type of argument that of all the arguments makes people incense and they confuse it with you're being mean or you're being silly or you're being impractical or you're being personal or I'm not. But that's what the left fears most, that they're elitist and that their progressive idea about identity politics is some kind of psychological mechanism that they don't want to live there. So if a person is very liberal living over there in a $20 million, $50 million home on the ocean, yeah, maybe that's they want to live there because they want to be with like kind and they want to be secluded from South Central. But they don't want to say that. So then they develop an abstract politics that's so crazy and so left-wing. Uh, and a good example is we've just seen in the news, Peter Fonda. So yeah. when he says that Baron Trump would be, should be exposed to pedophiles or Sarah Huckabee Sanders should happen, but he's riding from Paradise Valley, Montana. He's not down here in Los Angeles. His grandchildren are not in the LA public schools that are 70% Latino. And he's up there in a beautiful estate by the way, as I suggested, it could house five or six refugee families if he really wanted to help. He was so upset about the, the scenes of parents being separated. But So he creates a psychological mechanism, says, I'm Peter Fonda, I was an uh, easy rider, I'm a man of the left, but I'm living like a, an aristocratic uh, person at Versailles, and I, you know, I'm a 17th, 18th century aristocrat, and I don't like what that does to me, so I'll get even harder left. Right. And that's what Hollywood does, that's what elite media does, the MSNBC people, very wealthy people, Dianne Feinstein type people, uh, Nancy Pelosi type people. They're very, very privileged and wealthy and they do not live or put their kids in school with the other and they develop a psychological mechanism that squares that circle. Maxine Waters doesn't even live in her district. She's got a $4.3 million home in Hancock Park. And she does, and she and her husband were, she tangentially, but her husband directly in the 2008 financial crisis. Yes. And so... Profited tremendously. Yes, she did. And uh, so all of these people have profited. Nancy Pelosi, uh, Dianne Feinstein, their husbands are very active in real estate investment. Yeah. And they benefited from... Uh, the prestige of their spouses uh, when the government contracts, etc. But w people on the left don't do that, we're told. They're not interested in, in kind of scuzzy, crappy capitalism and profit making. And I, I think that that's the problem that they have. The left right now is a party of very wealthy people who like the comportment and the benefits of hyper-capitalism. And a, and a lot of poor people. And so that makes them, in a weird way, the Steyer brothers or George Soros, it makes them even more hyper left because they have to compensate for the concrete reality that they like capitalism like no other. The cronyism, and this was not a question that I, I intended to ask you, but I mean, you touched upon this. How is it in, in, in 2018 still allowed that you have somebody like a Nancy Pelosi that goes into government service and ends up with tens of millions of dollars? Or Harry Reid. Or Reid, oh yeah, I mean, yeah, perfect yeah. example. I don't understand it because uh, they, they are the people, they are the people or the representatives of the political uh, operatives who have told us that, you know, you didn't build that. Now's not the time to profit. Right. Uh, at some point you've made enough money. 
That's, we've heard all of that, and yet when you look at the Obamas, they signed a $60 million uh, book contract that they were negotiating while he was still president. And their entire careers have been one like the Clintons. How did the Clintons go from being broke to worth over five, five or six hundred million dollars? It was peddling the idea that Hillary at some point would re-enter as president. And now why in the world would Bill Clinton not get a million dollars a lecture anymore? Or why is Hillary getting 20,000 now, but she got 250,000 just two years ago? And, the, and of course the answer is she has nothing to offer, or I should say nothing to sell. Mm -hmm. And that's what's disturbing about it. And, and uh, so nobody's really talked about that paradox of very, very hard left elites having a psychological meltdown about the widening gulf of the way they live and the way they profess. And they're connected, I think. One explains the other. I think that's an interesting book idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I yeah. mean, you know, the, uh, you know, put some sunlight on what has uh, transpired over the past several, and it's not, it's nothing new. It's been going no. on for decades. The it's level of cronyism, D.C., yeah. Sacramento, all the state capitals, and, and worldwide as well. You see it in, in, in Europe. Um, North Korea, almost at this point, is almost old news. It, I mean, the news is moving so rapidly. Uh, but things can change in a minute, as they often do these days. And Kim Jong-un is, he sounds like he's saying the right things. He's talking about denuclearization. It's a hard, harder word to say than right. Um, which, by the way, no one really wants to mention that that means for the U.S. to pull out as well, right? I mean, yeah. we, we, we're having this discussion and everybody's celebrating this idea, but that also means that we're fully pulling back and uh, there's a safety issue there that, uh, or a security, national security issue. But with three generations of Kims who've played Lucy in the football, right? I mean, Madeleine Albright, 20, 30 years ago, however long ago that was. What do you believe Kim Jong-un's end game is here? Well, I think he understands that since 2006, he's been a valuable, he and his father have been valuable assets for China. And the rules were simply, we're the pit bull, you're the owner. Every once in a while, you cut the leash and you rail about nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles, or you try to sink a ship, or you try some incident, and then the Chinese say, I didn't know my pit bull was in your yard. I'm mm -hmm. so sorry. And that occupied American psychological uh, time, attention, material resources. And finally, he broke the rules of that game by saying that he could put a missile with an, a nuclear weapon on it into Portland or San Diego. At that point, Trump came in and said, we're going to go back to where we were before and not just before the missiles, but before you had nuclear weapons. That's the key thing. We, we have to go back to the point where they don't have nuclear weapons. We can't go back to the point where our troops are not in South Korea because then they win. They, they say, well, we just had this ruse of making <laughs> nuclear uh, ballistic missiles, and what did we get out of it? We got U.S. troops out, and we really n couldn't really do it that much anyway. Now we have nuclear weapons, and we have the troops out. Mm -hmm. So we can't go back uh, to where they want us to. We have to go back to... You don't have nuclear weapons. We have to go back to about 2005, not 2008, not 2015. And how do we get back there? We tell China, we're under your game now, and you're going to pay a real commercial price if you keep it up. And we tell the Japanese, who are third largest navy in the world now, we tell the Japanese, you know what? We've told you you can't do this and you can't do that in your constitution. We helped write. Go ahead and do it. And we're selling the same thing as South Korea. And then we're going to go back to China and say, do you really want these three countries in your neighborhood? And then finally, with George Bush and the um, six-party talks and with Barack Obama and strategic patience and with Bill Clinton on the agreed framework, the North Koreans felt that we were so invested in the post-war order and stability and tradition that we wouldn't dare ever do any of these things. Trump comes along and said, I'm capable of saying anything, doing anything to anyone at any time, anywhere. Whether he is or not, at some point he'll probably have to demonstrate. But for now, they look at him as a little bit unpredictable and crazy. And so he's made an... He, and then there's a final thing, and it's costly to build these weapons. They polluted much of their landscape. China's worried about that. And these sanctions are really reducing them to the Middle Ages. And this time, they don't think that when they broadcast pictures of starving North Koreans, they don't think Trump is going to bend, as did Obama and Bush, and pour in a bunch of money. And we'll see if it works or not. I'd say there's a 50-50 chance. Is Kim Jong-un 
does he desire peace or does he desire consumerism? I mean, he we, we, tr what Trump has done is he's well, basically shown him, look what you can have yeah. in Singapore. And Well, I don't no. think he cares about anybody but Kim Jong-un. I okay. think his, his attitude is, I'm a thug and a killer, as everybody would have to be to run this thuggish, kill, murderous government. And right. If I get off the back of the tiger, I'm a dead person. So how can I remain in power and have my elite and not have popular uprising because people are starving on, through these sanctions and then still have a world attention. And so he's thinking, well, maybe if I can get this embargo and sanctions over with by giving, get, ready, get rid of the missiles and maybe cutting a little back on the, so he's gonna be incremental and we're gonna have to say, we're not gonna let go of the sanctions. We're not going to deal any other way than what we said we were gonna deal with China and we're gonna let Japan go nuclear. So the question is, obviously, uh, a, a son of a father, of a, of a grandfather, that learned a certain method in dealing with the West. And they were right, too. They knew right. us better than we knew them. Right. And, and we saw that with, with both Republican and, and Democratic both, administrations yes. going yeah. back to, uh, uh, you know, decades now. The question is whether or not he sees the uh, Woodford's trees, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to think so, but leopards do, they change their spots, right? Yeah, I mean, it could happen, but the idea that he really wants commercial development it would be nice maybe if he felt it augmented his power, but it would also be dangerous because then the people might have a good life and then they might not be working 15 hours a day and they might have time to think about what he's doing. So more likely is uh, he wants to stay in power, he wants world attention, but he doesn't want his people starving to death yeah. because that's that's dangerous Is he pliable? I mean, did you see the video that Trump put together yeah, for them? Yeah. It's, it was a promotional video. This is what North Korea could be. <laughs> well, I mean, everybody's pliable if you have the, the necessary coercion. Yeah. So we're coercing them as we speak, and we're doing it with China, as I said. We're doing it with the nuclear card. We're doing it with sanctions, and we're doing it with alienating him. And, yeah. and yeah. we'll see how, what we can't give up. We can't just stop at any point until we actually certify that he's no longer nuclear. And that's going to be difficult. We touched upon only a, a half a dozen of the incredible number of array of issues that we have, but I know you have a flight to catch. Yep. Uh, Victor Davis Hansen, where can people find you? Uh, I have a website, victorhansen.com, mm -hmm. and uh, I have an angry reader column there, and I post everything there. So Terrific. You're also on Twitter. We see you on the, on the news networks, being interviewed all the time, and uh, your newest book, which we'd love to talk about, and if we had another hour to talk about with you, you. World War II, there's a, we had a lot of questions on Ricochet on that as well. Oh, good. So, uh, good. yeah, a lot of, lot of uh, history fans as, as well as myself. So thank you so much for thank joining for us and, me. and meeting us here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we uh, hope to speak with you again soon. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Folks, you can find us at uh, whiskeypolitics.net, ricochet.com, America's Voice Network on YouTube, and you can follow me at David Sussman on Twitter. Until next time, we'll talk to you again real soon at Whiskey Politics.